you for joining us. I'm Gregory Pfeiffer, the Executive Director of the Institute of Current World Affairs. I'm delighted to introduce our discussion on Lebanon and expression. Uh, so even before the pandemic hit this spring, 2020 was surely going to be a pivotal year for Lebanon. A little over a year ago in October last year, economic crisis prompted tens of thousands of protesters to take to the streets, calling for an end to decades of corruption among the political elite. When a massive explosion last August at the port of Beirut killed 190 people and destroyed large parts of the capital, it laid bare to the world the effects of that corruption. Three months later, what's happening to the protest movement in a society barely able to get by, let alone rebuild? How are people trying to affect change while contending with deepening political and economic collapse? And what does it mean for expression in the wider Middle East? Joining us is Professor Tarek El Aris, Chair of Middle Eastern Studies at Dartmouth College. He's a leading expert on contemporary Arab culture the author of Trials of Arab Modernity, Literary Affects and the New Political, and Leaks, Hacks and Scandals, Arab Culture in the Digital Age. Also joining us from Beirut is David Kenner, a fellow of the Institute of Current World Affairs, currently based in Lebanon. He's a widely published journalist who was previously Middle East editor at Foreign Policy Magazine. And our moderator, Zara Hankir, is a British Lebanese journalist and author. She's edited an award-winning best-selling collection of essays, Our Women on the Ground, Essays by Arab Women, Reporting from the Arab World. Her work has also appeared in many outlets, including the Los Angeles Times, BBC News, and Business Week. So the panel will talk for uh, 45 minutes or so before taking questions from the audience. Uh, to ask a question, please click on the hand icon to virtually raise your hand. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask a single brief question. And you can also communicate with us by using the chat function. And Zara will also go, go over those instructions. Thank you all very much. And with that, I will hand off to Zara. Thank you, Gregory, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, ICWA, for having us today. I'm super excited to uh, moderate this session. Um, which will look at the aftermath of the Beirut blast through the lens of new outlets of expression, which hopefully David will be touching on, and also the impact of the moment on arts and culture and framing that within a historical context and looking at previous trends as well. Um, and Tariq will be touching on those themes too. As Gregory mentioned uh, earlier, we will have time at the end for Q&A. So you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. You can also um, chat with us or you can use the um, Q&A function on, on Zoom. Um, so firstly, uh, David will be speaking for about 10, um, the, sorry, 15 minutes, and then Tariq will be speaking as well, but we will very much be in conversation. Um, first, I'd like to start with um, David, uh, who I worked with actually in Beirut as a journalist uh, many, many years ago. So I'm delighted to be asking David questions today. Um, firstly, maybe could you sketch out for us, David, the, the aftermath of the blast? I mean, you are in Beirut yourself. Um, you are witnessing the aftermath. You have been personally affected as well. Your home had been um, seriously damaged and how perhaps the aftermath of the blast has deepened the lack of trust in the state. I mean, obviously, as Gregory outlined, the lack of trust has been there for, for months and, and years, um, and it was expressed or manifested uh, with the October um, Revolution uh, last year. And then obviously that led to the economic crisis. But how are you viewing these developments um, in the aftermath of the blast? What are you seeing? Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you so much to Ikwa and, and Zahra for participating and Tarek as well. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, I guess I just want to start um, with a little bit about our neighborhood, my neighborhood. Um, I took a walk around it yesterday. Um, we just went back into lockdown here um, due to surging COVID cases. Um, you, you know, you really see very little repairs on the streets of Marmachayel these days, which is the name of my neighborhood. Um, you, you'll see some buildings which are which are under reconstruction, but a lot of the other ones, um, it, it just seems that that people are have given up the hope of repairing them, at least in the short term. 
Um, we've seen a massive currency devaluation in Lebanon since the October 2019 protests. Um, the, the lira on the black market is about one dollar to eight thousand lira. Um, previously, it was a dollar to fifteen hundred lira, so it's lost um, over five times its value, which means that it's very expensive to import goods to to repair these these buildings. Um, I talked to one professor of urban planning at American University of Beirut, and she's basically said, um, all these things were built, she literally said, all these things were built when the lira was $1 to 1500, and we were living in La La Land, and now we can't repair them. Um, she, she said that um, these buildings risk being the Holiday Inns of tomorrow. Um, the Holiday Inn is the, a reference to the, a gutted structure in downtown Beirut that was the site of some of the worst fighting during the Civil War and is still damaged to this day um, and still unrepaired. Um, so she's sort of raising the specter of some of this damage from the port explosion continuing um, and sort of being evident 30 years from now in 2050, uh, which is a really horrifying idea. Um, that's the economic damage in, in very brief. Um, but, but I also want to talk a little bit about the, the damage to the social fabric of the neighborhood and the, the social fabric of the country from the blast. Um, you know, in talking to my friends, my neighbors, various, various sources in writing about this country, um, you've really seen a collapse of trust in the state um, that, that's really been unable to muster um, a concerted effort to reconstruct the damaged areas from the port explosion. Um, walking around the neighborhood, um, you see um, graffiti of of hangmen uh, with with uh, the word in Arabic execution written under them. Um, you see graffiti against what they call the military occupation of the area. Um, this these these opinions might not be the majority opinion, but but there is certainly anger. There, there's just there, there's just sort of. Uh, a broad, vague, sometimes ill-defined anger um, at the political structures of the country that, that is shared even by people who participate in the political part, the traditional political parties of the country. That there, there's this sense that okay, the, the state's not going to protect us. We have to retreat to our sectarian community, our ethnic community, our religious community. These are the only structures that can still protect us. Um, and 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 I think that's that's a very dangerous and sometimes underappreciated dynamic. I, I think there's sometimes a sense from um, observers, even, even from some Lebanese, that the collapse of the system that we are witnessing will necessarily usher in something, something different and better. That, that if the economic situation, if the economic system collapses, if, if um, if the if the traditional elite don't have the same patronage networks they once did, maybe we'll have a chance to reform the political system. I, I'm afraid the answer is the opposite. That the more people become impoverished, the more they're going to have to turn to traditional sectarian ethnic warlords um, to survive. And, and and that's a really that, that that would be a really dark future for the country. Um, and I do you want know, to also touch on the idea, David, here, sorry to, to interrupt, but just the please. irony of that, in that these political elites have benefited from these sectarian structures and they've enjoyed impunity over the decades because mm -hmm. they have benefited from the structures that are in place. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's, you, there's a feeling of unreality sometimes when you talk to these political leaders that, you know, these are the most powerful people in the country. And you talk to them and they say, um, you know, I have no control over what happens with the state. Um, over, this, um, over the summer, or, or I think March or April, I interviewed um, a member of the Future Movement in Tripoli, Lebanon, um, a high-ranking member of the party in the largest Sunni city. It, it's a predominantly Sunni party. Um, the, the prime minister, um, the prime minister designate hails from the party. Um, and she was telling me, you know, we need a bloody revolution in this country. We need people, we need to people to sort of um, like, you know, hang those criminals in the street. And, and I was just sitting there thinking, you're a member of the political elite. I mean, you, you have control over, over this country. If you don't, really no one does. Um, and, and her conception was that, and I was asking her, you know, Tripoli is a very poor city. I was asking her, 
why is this city so poor after so many years of future movement dominance? And she says, oh, you know, we've been stopped by Syria, we've been stopped by Hezbollah. And, you know, she's not entirely wrong that those players have influence, but I, I simply do not believe that the future movement has no influence over, over those dynamics. Um, similarly, I was talking to a member of parliament um, from the president's party, the Free Patri Patriotic Movement, about the reconstruction of uh, my neighborhood. Um, and and the, what he was saying was, um, you know, we, we really, you know, the, the state really is dysfunctional. Um, you know, we, it's, it's, um, it's really a shame what's happened to the state. And, and I, I, part of what I wanted to say to him um, is, you know, you're the largest block in the state. Um, so, so there is this, um, I, I, I don't know how to describe it, I, other than sort of this air of unreality when you talk to some of these people that they are both benefiting from the situation um, and sort of, um, you know, deploring this situation as, as sort of, as, as, as outsiders who, who aren't affecting it. Um, and, and so, th so that's a that's a real um, that's a real problem that that um, that Lebanese who aren't affiliated with these parties are going to have to overcome. And and there are I, I mean I wouldn't say, as we saw in October 2019, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a broad majority in the country against the current system. The the question is, how do you organize them into a coherent movement to to topple the current system? Um, and really? um, I'd really like it if we could talk a little bit about what the protest movement looks like today. Um, you know, a year ago um, in October and November, and I, I, I actually was on the ground myself there, and I felt very much that the, the movement at the time cut through sect, it cut through class um, in a very visceral way. Um, and at the same time, I, I was there uh, more recently on the ground, and, and there was much more sort of there's this undercurrent of, of sectarianism there, which you've touched on. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that broadly speaking, the movement um, is not strong or it's, it, it doesn't have the same energy. It, it's just that there is, there's this disturbing undercurrent, which was very sad to see. Um, and I just wonder what your take um, on the movement currently in the current moment is. Mm -hmm. um... I, well, I, I guess I have two things. Um, I think there, there are two important things to say. First is that there's a divide within the protest movement between people who would say the, our main enemy here is Hezbollah and Iran. Um, people who think that those are the essential pillars of the current system and any movement we need that we, that we lead needs to sort of be oriented against them. And another, another segment that would say no, if we if we make this too anti Hezbollah, anti Iran, essentially we are playing into a sectarian dynamic. We are making this look like, or could it could be portrayed as an anti Shia movement, and essentially we need to keep with the the slogan previously, Kulon Yami Kulon, um, all of them means all of them, and um, basically shelve the issue of Hezbollah's arms for the moment and essentially criticize the corruption, graft, patronage um, abuses that, that happen um, among, all the, among all different actors. That's point number one. Point number two is the protest movement is dormant at the moment. Um, that, that has been partially due to COVID, partially due to economic situations. You do not see mass mobilization on the street. Um, you, you see every once in a while sort of an, an, ang an angry um, flare up um, of people sort of attacking banks or, or sort of staging protests in various places because of specific complaints about lack of wages paid. But, but you do not see the mass mobilizations you saw in October 2019. That does not there mean- were, that. Yeah, there were some sporadic um, protests in the aftermath of the blast. So perhaps mm -hmm. maybe you can touch on that as well. Um, you know, how has uh, anti-government expression changed in the current moment in the aftermath of the blast, but with all the factors that you've brought up as well, are people turning to other avenues um, besides uh, mobilizing on the streets? Are they mobilizing in different ways? And, and perhaps you can touch on that for us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I don't mean to suggest that the anger has abated. Um, the, the, there's definitely as much anger at the political situation as, as ever, probably more. Um, 
I think um, the, the economic crisis has made people focus on bread and butter issues. People need to simply survive. Uh, COVID has made it um, sort of under, under, understandably undesirable to gather in sort of large groups for a lot of people. Um, you, you do still see online, um, and I think uh, Tarek is going to talk about this in more detail, um, different modes of expression have um, arisen since um, September 29 that, that, are, that are very vibrant today. Um, you know, th this is a country where all TV stations are affiliated with a political party except the, the government-run station. Um, and, and so activists have really um, sort of pioneered um, new means to get their message out. Um, they've turned to homegrown sort of independent online outlets, often based on a social media platform, Twitter, Facebook. Um, these outlets, um, you know, they accomplish different goals. Some of them are focused on news reporting. Some of them are political mobilization focused. Some of them are passing information along about lectures or, or events to the general public. Um, recently, with the banking crisis, there's a new sector, there's a new sort of group of um, Facebook pages, um, YouTube pages on the banking crisis and the currency devaluation. Um, and some of these are quite popular. Um, I, I remember in Tripoli, I, I interviewed a man named Obeda Takriti, who launched a Facebook page called uh, Saha Wa Masaha, um, which aimed to sort of launch a discussion among Tripolitans about their shared grievances and the problems in the city. He was talking about how the Tripoli lacked a shared space for people to sort of debate big current, big current event issues. That, 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 that didn't really exist prior to October 2019. Um, and I checked in with him and it's still really going strong to this day. He, he, po he posts a video every day. It attracts more than a thousand people for each discussion session. Sometimes these are, these are extremely powerful um, and, and extremely popular um, ways for people to get their messages out. Um, the, the weaknesses, I'd say, is that these outlets often have little or no funding. The, the, the fact that they can be set up quickly um, is both is a double-edged sword. Um, they, they can also sort of go defunct equally quickly. Um, those producing it are often doing so for free. Um, you know, they, they're inspired by their belief in the cause. Um, and th that can be hard to sustain over, over sort of long periods of time at, at, at periods, especially during times of crises. Um, so, I mean, just going through my, um, my list of these that I follow, a lot of them from October 2019 are defunct. Um, Similarly, in terms of audience, um, they, they have a difficulty competing with the large traditional media. Um, there, there's some risk of, of preaching to the choir. You know, I, I'm just, you know, um, the, the same people go to them again and again. Um, it, it can be hard to reach people who are less convinced about, about the, the cause sometimes. Um, but, but overall, um, you know, they, they do have an extreme strength, which is that they can, they can sort of subvert the traditional party's control of, of the media. Um, so, I mean, I, we're, we're, Lebanon's currently in lockdown. Um, yesterday, there were no cars on the streets allowed whatsoever. Um, today, only cars with uh, an even license plate can drive. Um, tomorrow, it, it's odd. Um, my wife got a ticket today because she drove our odd license plate on an even license day. Um, j just um, in situations like that, it's um, it's really hard to get people organized and, and sort of um, to to have a mass mobilization. Um, so in some ways, we might have to wait till COVID is over until there's some plateau in the economic crisis to see some mass demonstrations again. But but I have no doubt that the the anger at the political system um, remains, and and that the the potential for mass mobilization is still very much possible in the country. Thank you. Thanks, David, for those insights. I mean, we saw a lot of theme of, you know, a potentially a new type of politics emerging here based on that mobilization that you speak of, David. And obviously, whereas the, you know, protest movement might be now dormant, um, we do still believe that there is um, the anger against the state and that, that anger is being manifested in different ways given the current constraints. And Tare, I mean, I know that you look at um, various forms of activism in the digital age um, 
and, and how they've emerged and developed, uh, particularly in Lebanon. So I'd love it if you could touch on, on that a little bit. Um, I know that you've referenced uh, the Nahda or, or the Arab Renaissance in your work a lot. And I'm wondering if you believe that what we're seeing now is some form of a Lebanese or a Beiruti Renaissance in the aftermath of not only the explosion, but the economic crisis and years and years of buildup of you know, um, anger against the state. Yeah, no, definitely. I think um, there's been for a while uh, different forms of delegitimizing of the state, of the political system. And, and, and this, this, this critique of the political system is not coming from the traditional ideological um, kind of bases, either Marxist ideology or Islamist or, you know, nationalist or pan-Arabist that we've been seeing for a while. I mean, of course, Beirut, Medinati, you know, all the civil kind of movements that, that, that took hold few year, already a few years ago. This is, you know, with the, with the garbage crisis, but also before the garbage crisis and also things that I've been kind of noticing online already, like that are 10 years old of people, you know, hacking government websites or leaking videos to expose, to, 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 to shame really government officials because of some form of, of mismanagement or, or the other. And, 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 and so these people who eventually moved onto the street in, 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 uh, through mass mobilizations, were already doing this online. We're already preparing and identifying who they were. And I actually start my book with this, like they say, we are just a group of people who can't sit in silence anymore. This is already in 2012 through these kind of interventions and creating some movement already on social media. So, so, the, so these people are really not your kind of traditional political parties or sectarian with, with clear also sectarian identification. Uh, but this is really the emergence of a civil society movement that, that we saw, you know, really kind of go into full force on October 17 of last year, you know, when the mass protest started and the Killon Yani Killon slogan uh, emerged. And, and so that's why I feel like, you know, I mean, I grew up in Beirut, I grew up in Sanaya, I lived through the war, through the whole war. And, and, and I just wanna like kind of zoom out a little bit and, and maybe think with you, not, not so much in terms of like, I know Madam Khayel when it was mostly like mechanics shops and a couple of electronic shops. Like I've, I've also seen Beirut where before this kind of reconstruction and so on. And maybe if we think about the 19th century Beirut and, and how did Beirut also, the modern Beirut that we've come to identify with as this like liberal, as this kind of port and, 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 and you know, this hospitable place that welcomed political dissidents and artists and from, from all over the Arab world. So, you know, Beirut of the 50s, Beirut of the 60s, with, with all this, this kind of energy. So, so, so to zoom out, I, I, I want to kind of maybe not think about this idea of the state versus the sectarian uh, politician, like maybe kind of challenge this binary a little bit. And maybe think of, uh, you know, forms of, 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 of critiques of power, forms of protest, but also cultural activism that might not really have this, the state or reforming the state as its ultimate goal, that maybe there are certain non-hierarchical movement that also are at the origin of this Beirut that we have come to, to recognize, love, and, and that made it what it is. And of course, you know, October 17, I was in Beirut actually, but I was in Beirut uh, because of an art biennial organized by Ashkal Alwan and was happening all over the city at Surstock Museum, at Beirut Art Center. And I happened to be there when actually the, the demonstration started. So it's very also interesting, like this kind of cultural moment, people were there from all over, artists, curators, and so on. And then here you have this, this, this kind of, you know, mass mobilization that's taking place in the street. So if we kind of go back, if we, if, we, if we go back to, let's say the 1860, you have someone like Boutros al-Bustani, who's bicentennial, he was born in 1819. So they were celebrating last year, his 200th anniversary at AUB, they had exhibitions and so on. 
uh, and Bustani wrote this amazing book in 1860, right after the civil war that consumed Mount Lebanon, where you know there were there was uh, massacres of Christians in Damascus and so on. So so he wrote this book, he, and and he started establishing these these schools to prevent this kind of sectarian strife. Like, how do we never ever have to deal with this again? And, and, and one of the things that Bustani established is something called Al-Madrasa Al-Wataniya, which exists today in Za'l al you know, 18, in 1863. Uh, it still exists. And, and, and Bustani started, and other people around him, like, how do we create uh, a national culture? How do we create a culture that allows us to transcend sectarianism, to, tra to, to, to kind of enter into what is, you know, what was at the time being talked about as the Nahda? as this kind of, you know, renaissance, as this kind of awakening where, you know, this Ottoman province, you know, that was Beirut, but various also Ottoman provinces uh, in the region were kind of somehow coming to themselves to think, to create a certain awareness of who they are culturally, politically, also in, in an urban setting. I mean, the port, the development of the port, the expansion of the port happened in the 1880s, you know, the, the, the German emperor comes to Beirut in 1898, you know, welcomed at the port, uh, the new expanded port. So the port is also bringing journals published in Beirut, sending them to Alexandria and vice versa. So the port also, and, and, and the, the areas around the port, like Marim Khayel, Za'al Blad, Surso, I mean, all these neighborhoods that were outside of the city walls were incubators of this Nahda, of this, of all these journals and, and, and schools and institutions that are being founded without, you know, without a clear, not, not because some, it wasn't coming top down. It's like these people, these, these, these editors, these entrepreneurs, you have Abdul Qadir Kabbani who founds the Al Maqasid, you know, in his house, he calls people and says, you, how much can you pay? You know, I have a shop in the, in the souks. Okay, I'm going to give this shop to this foundation, 1878. This is, these are people who were mobilizing without an assured future, without an assured outcome. It was this, this, this sense that we need to do something, that we need to mobilize, that we need to found a school and, and, and we need to like ask these nuns to leave this convent so that we can turn it into a school in this mountain. And, and Bustani writes this amazing piece called Khutbah Fi Adab Al-Arab or, you know, Lecture in the Culture of the Arabs, where he describes, this is already in 1859, he describes all these villages, all these families who are donating money to, to build a printing press or to, to, to you know, to, to help move some religious order to turn the convent into a school to teach kids what the Muslims are doing, what the Christians are doing, what he's doing with the Madrasa Wataniya. So you have this culture of, of, of working, of mobilization, of, of Nahda, of awakening, without necessarily having a clear uh, idea or of where this is going to lead. So, and, and this is what I see also happening, or that this is, has been happening in Beirut um, for a while now, I mean, a lot of these organizations, art organizations, they, they've been working without necessarily saying, okay, our work is going to lead to a reformed state in which we're all going to live equal with, with transparency and all the kind of rules and, and requirements that, that our understanding of a modern liberal nation state uh, are. So, th so there's this kind of work that, that that is faith that somehow what you're going to do is going to get you somewhere although you don't have certainty that the future is going to somehow to respond or, or is going to somehow guarantee that your work is going to go into an institution into yeah. strengthening a larger institution. I'd like to actually I, it's fascinating what you just mentioned because recently when I was in Lebanon for a couple of months me and my mother I'm from Saida and we were working in the old suit Saida and then we we saw that there was a hammam that had been reopened um, it's the oldest one in the city and I think it reopened at some point last year and we went in we had a little bit of a tour and it almost it, it was such a gorgeous moment but it almost felt a little bit jarring because here you are in sort of this broader 
uh, very dire, harrowing situation of like the country is crumbling at its very seams and, and you know, the economic crisis is affecting people in such dire ways. And then you, you enter this beautiful space and, and there's, a, there's this level of cultural nostalgia there. And you know that these people are working on preserving the heritage of the country. And at the same time, the country itself feels like it's falling apart in so many ways. How do you reconcile those two things? And also, you know, when it comes to the sort of art and activism, um, obviously so much, we risk losing so much. But people, as David was saying, are really focused on, on you know, eating, on the, on the bread and the butter and living and getting through every day. And I just wonder where... How do you fit that sort of actuation that we see? What is your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, activism is not just simply like, I mean, art definitely is one of them, but it is also like the mobilization that, I mean, I didn't visit Beirut since the port explosion, but the mobilization that, that people in neighborhoods, helping people to clean, to rebuild, coming, I mean, people were, you know, my apartment was damaged. I mean, the people coming and giving money to like the, you know, the concierge say, okay, you know, how much did you pay for glass? There is this, you know, organization that's helping people, you know, with, with, with fixing the glass that has been shattered. You know, I mean, this is something, there is no FEMA. I mean, I, I was in New York when 9-11 happened. I mean, you know, there you have to go register FEMA, you know, all the, mm. but here, it's like they're passing by looking at the building. So there is something, how do you, this is very hard to theorize as part of a nation building process. Mm -hmm. But this is not, but this is fundamental because if you live in Beirut, you understand that these, that these you know, very kind of non-hierarchical, not clearly institutional processes allows the place to carry on. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that I'm trying to stay hopeful in a very unhopeful situation. That's where I'm trying to go. And I'm trying to say, maybe we can also think about openings in this collapsed future. Because now, I mean, really, there's no future. There is no hope. There is no, I mean, you know, the situation is dire. People are being starved. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like, we also need to kind of zoom out and, 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 and maybe try to think about these movements, these kind of not, you know, it's not just simply either the sectarian, you know, chief or, you know, or the, or, or, or the transparent state. I mean, these are the two forms of salvation. And, and, and we need to kind of brainstorm and try to be more creative about looking at what happened in the past and, 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 and also what we lived through during the war, like these kind of non-traditional, non-conventional circuits that somehow keeps Beirut, uh, you know, allows people to kind of renovate uh, those, the Hammam and Saida, but also, you know, when that allows them somehow to continue on in, in, in some other way. So I just feel like, you know, we need to ring the the bell of, 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 you know, catastrophe, but also like there is a, there is a history in Lebanon of, of what could be done after the catastrophic, mm -hmm. after the civil war, the kind of rebuilding and re-engagement. And, and we need to look at those and also give those uh, their proper uh, place in the way we come up with models to predict uh, how things are going and, and so on and so forth. Sure, I'd like to kind of take a step back as well to the explosion itself. I mean, why did you personally find it to be so powerful and significant in the in the material, not just the material, but also the metaphorical level? Um, and then just looking at sort of what's what's happening to Beirut today and that's how it's been transformed as a city, you've said that um, the attack is almost like a, an attack on Be Beirut's modernity and modern history and the kind of communities that Lebanon, you know, has, has made possible. Like if you look at, for example, community like Carantina, where um, you have a, a migrant community, refugee community living there, of course, it's an impoverished community. But I mean, so many of these dynamics are now being changed and altered. And the port explosion sort of really brought that to the core. So I'd love it if you could comment on that. No, I mean, definitely, this is really the port the, the 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 19th century neighborhood. This is the origin of Beirut's modernity. This is what made Beirut 
this, the modern city that it was. It didn't start with the oil boom, you know, and, and, and the 50s. It's already started with, you know, Zalublat, with the Madrasa al wataniya with Makassi, with all these entrepreneurs who were building the city up. And then eventually, you know, already people were coming to Beirut from Egypt, but also, again, people were fleeing Beirut to Egypt, like, you know, Al-Ahram, the major newspaper in, in Egypt, was founded by Lebanese. I mean, Egypt was really the Gulf of the time, you know, where you had this land of opportunities where a lot of, you know, Shawam or people from the region were going. But, but I think the port, the explosion at the port, it is really, the danger is this, is to undermine the, 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 the makeup and the history of modern Beirut. And I think that is very serious. But then you find, you know, like Ashkar al Wan, they fixed up the glass and they made a call for artists, say, if you lost your space, come, we are offering this space for you to work. At. You know, their, their money is frozen in the bank, we're gonna do our, we're gonna call on volunteers to come and teach courses and have a year long, you know, school open to everyone for free. So, so also like I, I want to acknowledge the severity and the catastrophic, but at the same time, I want to, I want us to, to, to stay hopeful and, and to keep and yeah. to really give the time and the space for those people who are doing things that might, you know, that might allow us to continue then. I do appreciate that, Tara, and I think it can be easy to forget the work that these people are doing in the current moment, given how dire it is. I mean, there's actually this wonderful movement called Lebanese Glass, where I think um, they brought the, all the all the glass together to make like um, bri, bri, my, how do you say that in English? So they're making, um, you know, beautiful um, objects out of uh, the glass from the from the explosion. It's it's sort of moments like these, this, and the kind of resourcefulness that we're seeing. We're staying away from the word resilience. <laughs> this incredible resourcefulness that we see among the people and the energy that we see that's really actually very heartwarming. And I really appreciate, Tade, that you're making this part of the current discourse in the current moment, because I don't think we're talking enough about this, about the importance of preserving the culture and the heritage and celebrating the people who are doing exactly that. So, so thank you very much. Um, do we know how to translate Ibrit Mai into English? Jug. Jug, yes. Water jug, glass jugs. Yes, that. Um, so we, we have some time for questions. So if anybody in the audience would like to ask, please go ahead. In the meantime, I will just be throwing out questions to the two of you. Um, Gregory has um, actually uh, posed the question of how the Arab world responded to developments um, in Lebanon, whether it's the economic crisis, uh, the protests and the blast, and how much they've registered. Perhaps, um, David, you could answer that for us and, and how, how relevant that is um, in the current moment for, for Lebanese. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, I, I um, <coughs> excuse me, I, I really appreciate Tarek's um, focus on sort of the the people of the city and the people of the, the region, not just the governments. Um, because I, I, I do think, especially when considering this question, they're, um, they're, they're very different responses. Um, you know, I, I've um, been traveling back and forth to Saudi Arabia um, for the past two years. Um, and, you know, I, you just in conversation, you hear a lot of um, sympathy for Lebanon. You hear a lot of concern about developments there. Um, of course, filtered through, um, you know, whatever person I'm talking to is political um, affiliations and perspective. Um, and, and I mean, if you read the media, the, there is a lot of um, sort of sympathy and concern for, for the obvious tragedy that's unfolding here. Um, when you look at sort of the government level, um, I, I think the response has been more muted. A lot of countries in the region are worried about their own crises. Um, speaking about Saudi Arabia, um, I, I would say that there remains a disengagement from Lebanon and a sort of willingness to let the Emiratis take the lead um, in the country. There's been some promises of um, international funding, um, I think from the Emiratis and the Qataris um, for, for rebuilding. Um, though I am not sure what has been delivered. Um, Turkey would be the other party that, that has some role here as well. Um, I, I, nothing, nothing to match the scope of the crisis, um, which, um, which I think is important, both in the Arab world and sort of the broader international community. 
I mean, there's much to be said about France, but that's a whole other um, bag of worms. So we can <laughs> we can avoid getting into the the bailout the discussions over bailouts and so on. Um, I'd love to kind of return to this idea of sectarianism and patronage in the state. Um, David, you know, your outlook seemed to be um, slightly grim, and I think uh, quite realistic, in fact, um, uh, based on at least what I'm hearing amongst my uh, family members and the things that they say and what you see on television, for example. Um, at the same time, you have this, uh, while you do have this strong patronage and loyalty towards certain parties that is manifested in different ways, you also have a level of bravery among the people that I hadn't seen before. For example, you might have a woman from a particular village on television, on the evening news, you know, on the ground cursing Hassan Nasrallah. Um, that's not something that, uh, that would have been very common uh, several years ago. So you do have, I think, these two different strands, uh, these two different sort of um, trends. Uh, and I just wonder if you, you know, I know we can't predict what's going to happen, but how do we feel about um, what is unraveling today in the state and sectarian loyalties and sensibilities in the context of the, of the economic crisis in particular? Perhaps we can go back to the idea of patronage a little bit and thought it, maybe you can also comment, comment on whether or not sectarian, sectarianism plays at all into your analysis of uh, cultural preservation. Yes, please start, start at it if you'd like. Yes, we'll come back to you. Okay, I mean, I think ultimately uh, sectarianism is, is, you know, it's pervasive. I mean, it is really everywhere in Lebanon at some level. But I do think, I mean, if you look at uh, like the, 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 those sectarian chiefs, what, what empowered them was also, I mean, how do they keep the loyalties? It's through money and, and political, you know, and military protection. And, and when these sources are not as clear, you know, when they can't pay, they can't provide the services that they were providing for their constituencies, that also undermines the legitimacy of their power because it's a service model, right? I mean, it's a cl client, clientelist model to use a political uh, theory kind of model. But, but so I do feel that, and, and, and these kind of, Definitely, there, there is an attempt to create a sectarian uh, paranoia. Like there is one sect that's trying to dominate all others. You know, there, there is this sense of uh, there is an attempt to kind of scare different sects and and to kind of push them to uh, you know to to fall in line with the leaders. But again, we saw with with. Uh, I go back to, you know, Beirut Medinati, I go back to recent history where there is a lot of breaking with these kind of sectarian loyalties. And you see struggles within families where the kids are, are <laughs> fighting with the parents and saying, enough, what did this sectarian chief do to you, really? I mean, come and vote in this other way. And, and there was, and of course, it didn't go far enough. Some neighborhoods were completely... Uh, you know, we're less prone to these kinds of these kinds of crossings. But I do think sectarianism is 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 tied to an economics uh, mm -hmm. that, and if that economics is changing, and it is changing, you know, those those the kind of funding, the kind of regional, you know, backers of certain chiefs. I mean, th this is also going to reflect on the ground, and people will have to realize that I can't just simply continue to rely on this, and maybe I need to eventually come up with a system that is less um, reliant on that particular source. So this is my hope. I mean, I, mean yeah. I, I can't predict that for sure, but I think this is where I think things can go. It's definitely a valid uh, point that there's, you know, so much emphasis on the, the economic aspect of it here that we need to really be looking at. And, uh, and I also appreciate that you're hopeful, Tare, even in the, in the discourse of sectarianism in the country. Uh, David, would you, sh would you have any hope at all um, based on what Tare said, or do you feel I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I just think it's important to like, be honest about what I'm seeing, which is, yeah. this is the worst. I, I came to this country in 2006, as you know, um, war with Israel that year. I, I left in 2008 after the May 2008 clashes, came back in 2014 when ISIS was bombing Dahye and there was the Syrian war next door and an influx of Syrian, <clears throat> sorry, an influx of Syrian refugees. And this is by far the worst I've ever seen in the country. 
Um, and it's not close. Um, so, I mean, I just feel like I wouldn't be being honest if I said that this, this looks very good or that, that I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, all of our friends are leaving. I mean, the Lebanese middle class is leaving the country. Um, it, you know, a lot of those people are, are the same people you would hope to build sort of an activist core and artistic social core that, that could imagine a better future. Um, of course, I'm, there, there are, you know, when, when you talk to the politicians, when you talk to the security people, you have this opinion of the, the you sort of like, the, you just have no hope for the country. And then you talk to normal Lebanese who run businesses, who have, who, who, who are artists here, and, and you realize just the amount of amazing human talent in the country. Um, and, and that's still there. And every time I have one of those conversations, um, it, it sort of brightens my mood and I, I'm more optimistic. Um, I, I leave the conversation more optimistic than, than I started. Um, but, but I wouldn't be being honest if, if I said anything other than this is the worst that I see that I've seen the country in the past 15 years and I see no evidence that it's getting better. When it comes to sectarianism specifically, though, yeah. how do you feel when it comes to the discourse? How has it, has it changed? Has it? It has changed. I, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what I've seen is a polarization. You see some people who, who benefit not at all from the system, who are more willing to critique sectarian leaders than they've ever been. The, the woman who was critiquing Hassan Nasrallah on TV. Um, and, and, you do, and you see people in, in our neighborhood um, there's anti-Michel Aoun graffiti down the street, by the way, saying um, like Michel Aoun is dead or I, either Michel Aoun is dead or it doesn't matter whether he's dead or not. But it's basically like, um, you know, it is basically uh, asleep at the wheel. Um, and so you have people like that who are just um, really sort of um, angry and rancorous at the sectarian system and really willing to imagine something new. But you do have another part of society that they're only tethered to economic sustain sustainability and, and any livelihood is through these systems. Yeah. And what, what I've seen is those people have become more invested in the in in the in the sort of persistent resilience of these sectarian systems, of these sectarian leaders than before. Um, you see situations where people are sort of um, more Catholic than the Pope, you know, is that um, pra praising, pra praising leaders even more than, than they sort of would, would um, praise themselves. Um, so so I, I really do see a polarization between those two camps. Before there were people, there were sort of more people in the middle and, and what, what I've, in my sense, is that that middle is sort of fading away. Yeah, and this actually um, gets back to what I mentioned before, which is that undercurrent that is there. So even though you might have these protest movements, whether they're on the ground or elsewhere, you know, online in the digital age, the undercurrent is still there. And, and in some cases, thugs are being sent to the ground, for example, and in yeah. various places too. So these are worries. But I appreciate here the, the sort of the, the, the hopefulness that we have, but then the complete absence of hope, because I think it really does speak to, to how many Lebanese feel, right? Um, and I think also I'd like to transition this discussion into a fact that we haven't touched on, which is that the two Lebanese people in this discussion currently do not live in Lebanon. Um, <laughs> and David, you do live in Lebanon yourself. And, and this points to something you touched on, David, um, which is, you know, many Lebanese people are leaving. The Lebanese diaspora is growing. Some people are referring to this as an exodus. I think it's important um, discussion to be had. Also, um, Carol Kenner has just an, uh, asked a question, Carol, um, I believe is related to you, David, <laughs> um, about, you know, whether or not we are seeing an exodus here um, of Lebanese people in the aftermath of the financial crisis uh, and the explosion. I mean, based on local media figures, the year-to-date levels of emigration have increased by about 42%. We had the Lebanese uh, Syndicate for Doctors recently came out and made a statement and said 400 uh, doctors have fled the country, which is a significant number. We also have a mental health crisis in the country. Um, and in the midst of all of this, people are leaving. And that deepens, I, I think, a sense of desperation and sadness um, and compounds the feeling that there is no hope in certain um, segments of society. So how would you uh, comment on that, on specifically the Lebanese exodus? Perhaps, Tariq, you can talk to us about that, because I'm not so sure that that would impact negatively this cultural renaissance, because I think many people outside of Lebanon 
uh, are working on Lebanon and its cultural heritage? You know, I mean, I, I, I live in the States. I go to Beirut maybe three times a year. Yeah. And, and I'm involved in, you know, Ashkal Alwan, Beirut Art Center, UB. I'm, I'm involved with, you know, I give talks. I, I'm engaged in what's happening on the ground. So, and, but so definitely, I mean, I think the Lebanese diaspora has always been <laughs> around and, and has been always essential. Even already in the Nahda, they were going to, the U.S. to Brazil to all kinds of places, and and they were part of this. What made Beirut the modern place that it was? It's precisely the diaspora. And of course, this is not to minimize what's going on now. It is catastrophic. It is really catastrophic, and I understand. And I, uh, but but also like you know, I, I'm just trying to kind of zoom out, you know, and I'm trying to 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 kind of put us in a situation where you know during the war also people packed up their kids, their teenagers, they sent them whoever, an aunt in Tennessee or, or like some cousin in, in, in London or whoever, yeah. just to get them out so that they don't join the militias that were beginning to form in the in 75 and 76. Mm -hmm. So the pe people just, the, 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 um, the fragmentation that happened was just unbelievable. And of course, you know, I understand, David, you know, there's uh, the financial situation. I mean, now, even during the war, we never had it that I mean, regardless of, you know, bombs and, and kidnapping and ransom. I mean, this is like, there was not a time when you couldn't get your money out of the bank. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, the devaluations happened. They happened in the 80s. Overnight, people lost all their money. So that is not new. And eventually, the system found a way to stabilize this. But, but people went from, you know, being comfortably middle class to having nothing already in the 80s. I remember when the dollar jumped that when the Lebanese lira got devalued. So, so I'm just trying to say that, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a terrible situation. It is catastrophic, but also I want us to kind of keep these things in mind. And, 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 and there is a, I, you know, again, we don't want to talk about resilience and so on, but there is, maybe this is the Nahda. There is another Nahda, Nahda means yeah. to stand up also there is there is also we, we need to also focus on that and talk about that and support that rather than just simply like you know paint a kind of a, a dead end uh picture because that's okay then but then we can't talk anymore because it's sure it's I, I would love it if both of you could touch on specific organizations uh david whether that's media organizations or, or you know that people should be following in this particular moment or even individuals and thought it the same from you if you could potentially mention um you know some specific artists who you think we should be looking at just so that our audience can can look into them as well yeah absolutely and and you know Tarek, your point is, your point is very well taken that um the Lebanon has seen a lot um, and, and it, it, it still has persisted and, and there, there's still wonderful things about it. Um, we all know the history. Um, so, so it is important not to be too doom and gloom. Um, you know, Tarek mentioned uh, Beirut Madinati, which um, it does important work about political mobilization. I, I believe it arose with the municipal elections um, uh, several years back um, and then continues to be active these today on important local issues. Um, uh, a good source for news that I follow is um, called Megaphone, um, is a Facebook and Twitter page um, th that has important, that has good updates. Um, uh, legal Agenda is another that um, really has excellent legal, uh, excellent commentary on sort of the main legal, um, environmental, political flashpoints in the country, um, written by um, real experts on the on these issues. Um, and then there's there's a ton that that, is, that have taught me a lot about the financial crisis as well. Um, I think every Lebanese has gotten a crash course in um, macroeconomics in recent days. Um, an excellent one is um, Finance for Lebanon, um, which which, um, which has good commentary and. Um, you know, the, the Lebanese press is now full of um, commentary on the economic situation as well. Um, you know, the, for, um, for, for people interested in, um, you know, English language news, the uh, Lorient Le Jour um, launched uh, an English language uh, website recently called Lorient Today, um, which, which is another good source of information. 
Um, so, the, so there are um, a lot of um, really inspirational um, journalists, um, activists around the country. Um, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Riyad Obesi, who is a Lebanese journalist who has done amazing work, um, sort of following the money, tracking corruption in the country, um, and has really um, held leaders to account. And um, just to, to, to talk about an optimistic thing, the, the work Riyadh does would not be possible, I don't believe, in, in any other country in the Arab world I can think about um, at the moment. Um, really combative, strong, um, well-informed journalism um, that, that um, you know, it proves that Lebanon still is sort of a, an outlet for that freedom of speech, um, you know, investigative journalism that, that sometimes is um, stifled elsewhere. And indeed, some of these people do actually face threats from the state, but they continue to do the work that they do, which is incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, David. Tarek, how about you? Any yeah, suggestions? The legal agenda, the work that Khaled Sari is doing, for sure, Megaphone, which again, you know, people who were never writing or never engaging with the political situation started because of this. So that's where I also feel a little hopeful. It, it kind of brought people who were not at all engaging with that. Uh, people who teach at the UB, people inside, outside, I mean, a whole, um, you know, a whole array of people. I mean, if, again, the cultural organizations, you know, Ashkal Alwan, Beirut Art Center, even like Su'ad Tayyib and what Kamal Mzawa is doing and bringing, yeah. you know, uh, keeping you know, people who relied on these these outlets for, for organic goods to, to produce, to, to, to women in, in the camps, like cooking and, you know, like all kinds of, um, you know, outlets for, for things that are not readily accessible traditionally in, in Beirut. So. Yeah, and I think also important to touch um, on social media too, which has played such a tremendous role um, when it comes to actually giving so many people who ordinarily wouldn't have had an opportunity to mobilize in a particular way to do so through social media, whether that's, you know, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or other outlets. Um, I think in particular in the case of Lebanon, um, citizen journalism as well, a lot of citizen journalists take to social media too, and plenty of artists do as well. So, so many accounts to follow online, just looking at the names and the organizations that David and Tarit um, have mentioned. Um, so I just wanted to uh, ask if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to make, um, because we are close to the end of the discussion, but thank you both for tremendously um, informative um, chat. David. Um, I, I think I've said my piece. I just really want to thank you and Tarek for, for participating in this. I, I think it's a really important discussion um, and, and I'm so glad that I could have it with two extremely well-informed people. Thank you, David. I, as I said, I do appreciate that there are different sort of viewpoints here and very much that Tarek brought some positivity to the discourse, which I think is sorely um, lacking. So thank you. Thank you, Tarek. And again, you know, I, I need to stay that say, stay positive because I need to return. <laughs> so there is. Well, I was actually going to say, you know, when we talked about all the the the, um, the people who fled the civil war, for example, many people did return, yes. um, and among those people were my family and my parents. Continue to live in Lebanon um, and to to give back and, and to contribute and to help improve the situation and important to know that so many Lebanese people are doing that and it is a fight for them day to day to do that and they continue to do it and so much love and respect um, to the Lebanese who are who are really sticking this out you know there have been grim projections and grim numbers about people leaving Lebanon but there are also people there who are doing this very good work on the ground so I think important to note that wonderful thank you Thank you. Thank, thank you all. I'll just jump back in to wrap up and just say thank you all for a, a fascinating discussion, expertly moderated. Uh, and I'll also add, uh, hopeful, despite the um, terrible state of affairs in Lebanon. Uh, thanks also for um, our uh, audience for joining us. This has really been terrific. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.